Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today is the 16th of Ramadan that we are recording this podcast for. Yesterday was the 15th, which is a significant day uh, for all Muslims and particularly for myself. Um, many of my teachers passed away on the 15th of Ramadan. So I, uh, alhamdulillah, gave iftar at our local mosque. Um, so, namely number one being the the day that Imam Hassan Mustafa, the grandson of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi was born. So that is the first nisbah that the house of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did Ithar Sawab there. Then, what we, he, we used to call him the Bari Ustad. So my grandfather's teacher, Bolan Affairs Ahmed Awaisi Sahib, Rahimahullah, he passed away on the 15th of Ramadan and just about six, seven years ago, he in his lifetime had authored over a thousand books. SubhanAllah. This guy was a walking, talking encyclopedia. SubhanAllah. And then also Muhammad Alawi, Rahimahullah, one of the biggest scholars of the uh, sub, of, of the, the Middle East of the previous generation, passed away on the 15th of Ramadan. We made that intention as well. So with all these collective intentions, Alhamdulillah, Allah Ta'ala accept. Today being the 16th, uh, getting onto subject now, sorry guys, got a little emotional there. Um, we have two new panelists, fresh faces, mashallah. Fresh also because they're young, fresh because they're new on, 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 on this podcast. Uh, to my right hand side, we have Brother Ahmed, and right in front of myself, we have Brother Abraham. So, uh, let's begin with these two panelists that we have, and then I'll introduce this subject in, in a while. I'll let Ahmed uh, uh, introduce himself. Ahmed Bai, Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Alaikum salam. Welcome on this podcast. I will share with the viewers in a minute why I've called you guys on. But your background, as I know, from uh, Stirk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from Stoke, yeah, so oh, I'm... Uh, was, was that correct? Um, yeah, it was okay, yeah, it was oh, correct. Could I push a bit more? Mm, it's, it's okay, it's, it's good, okay, yeah. It's okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so your background, Bismillah. Yeah, so I am a law student okay. at Manchester Metropolitan University. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a second year. I am also part of the Islamic Society at the university. I'm the charity lead, which means I'm involved with all the, the running of the charity events that we have. And I'm also the student affairs officer for our society. Alhamdulillah. Yes. So if people don't know if you need any any help, he's a go-to man. You go to him. And uh, uh, Abrabai, mashallah, assalamu alaikum to you as well. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you for being here, taking time out after Tarawih. I'm, I'm sure you guys are shattered. Mm. 20 long raka'at, especially uh, behind Hafiz Yasin as well. <laughs> can we, uh, can we get it? Can we get it? Yeah, yeah. No, he's got a beautiful voice. Beautiful. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. And, um, so, so um, I'm also a student at uh, Manchester Metropolitan University. Okay. Um, I'm in second year of mechanical engineering. Um, I've only recently started becoming a part of ISOC. Um, I've, I've also got my own society. Uh, I'm the chair of the Entrepreneurs Society. Okay. So um, obviously that that's a lot more business minded and business oriented rather than ISOC. But obviously, Alhamdulillah, as I've kind of grown to learn um, mm -hmm. about my dean and fall in love with my dean. I've kind of oh, wow. grown to um, love ISOC because that is, at university, that is a community that you want to kind of be a part of, isn't it? Sorry, sorry. Okay, your love for the dean, how recent is it? Or is it something from... Very recent. Very recent. Very recent. Okay. Uh, now, obviously, I think um, a lot of Muslims, we grow up Muslims by name, mm. but we don't resonate with it. Okay. And that was me up until maybe even, I mean, uh, September, uh, the weekend course, no, uh, we can call classes. I think that really kind of sparked my interest, and um, oh. I think you say, oh, you say, I'd, I'd correct me if I'm wrong. When Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wills good for someone, He increases them in ilm, yes. and I think that's what's happened with me. As oh. I've so obviously oh. the weekend classes are amazing. Um, I've learned so much, and with that increase in knowledge, I've been able to sort of connect with my deen on a different level. So oh. So oh. Okay, uh, your first year at university, student, yeah? second year, second, second year. year. Mm. Okay. Now it's interesting you said you were majority of, of, of us are Muslim by name and only recently you've had that spark and you've resonated yeah. in that way. So funny enough that leads me to the subject today as well. So the subject today that I wanted to discuss was the Muslim identity. How significant is it? 
uh, and its significance in today's society. So what's your general, when somebody says Muslim identity, and you've already used the word like uh, Muslim by name and only now start to resonate, how, what contrast do you see in your Muslim identity before this change was happening and where you are now? What difference do you see? Um, I think it's, it's more to do with, um, I need to think about that for a second. It's a good question. So I, th I think, I guess, before I, I used to identify with myself how I was physically. Maybe, is that a good way of putting it? Yeah, yeah. In terms, yeah. I used to be like, this is, this is what I am, this is what I own, this is who I am, this is where I originated from. Okay. But now it's fully switched to where it's more about my mindset and about what I believe. Mm. It's, I think that's, I don't know if that's I'm a good way to put it. Yeah, like, so I think really the, the Muslim identity, the way that I see it, it's always been a part of my sort of, obviously we're Muslims, we're brought up in Muslim households, it's been a part of our um, characteristics, like we're Muslims, that's our identity, yeah we're, we're born here, we, we work here, we go to school here, but mm. our sort of defining, the defining factor of our personality is that we're Muslim, so for me it's always been a part of my sort of personality that we don't do certain things that other people might do because we're Muslim and that's a part mm -hmm. of, our, of our identity so that's the way that I see it but I do get that over time it can become something that defines you more than the way it did previously I think mm -hmm. things happen to people in their life that draws them closer to, to Islam and, and that okay. can you okay. know yeah do you not also see that we have Islam and then we have tradition hmm. yeah Many of us have grown through the, the years basically being more traditional mm. than Islamic. Mm. And now Brother Abraad could probably refer to this a lot more. And these are things that I, I do track in, in, my, in our teaching as well. That now that you are studying these sciences and the seerah and the fiqh and things, when you go back home, don't start gunning your parents and telling, gosh, you're wrong, <laughs> you're wrong, this is wrong, that was wrong. Because they probably not had that exposure or, or that experience of studying the yeah. volume of the deen yeah. Yeah. in that way so whenever they practice their religion if i'm not wrong for, for majority of our previous generations it was a tradition hmm. yeah it wasn't the identity the muslim muslim identity it was more tradition passed down hmm. yeah my parents did this so i'm doing it yeah. yeah my parents used to pray so i'm praying then you would fast in the month of ramadan so i'm just fasting but the essence of the fasting and and the worshiping i think that's starts to kick in around your age I think you. I've, I want to mention the point you said identity, right? Okay. And I, I think so. For in order for our my parents, for example, okay, for them to be able to identify as Muslims, they need to know what a non-Muslim is. They've never experienced that in growing up in uh, Pakistan. Oh, Whereas beautiful, for us, beautiful. we are able to identify as Muslims because we know what is not a Muslim. Because and we have that exposure. Exactly, exactly. Mm. And we're not necessarily. I, I don't want to say blindly following, but we're not following with a tradition. Mm. Right, mm. we have a chance to experience other things and say, okay, this is who I am. This is what resonates with me, mm. and what resonates with me is what my beliefs are. So right. Are. So are. the beautiful point you make. Yeah. Because back home, everybody's a Muslim. Exactly. So it's just the culture, it's the lifestyle, and that's say you're Muslim in that exactly. lifestyle. Yeah. But over here, we we face major challenges mm. when it comes to the identity of a Muslim. Now you guys are UCC students. Mind me being a bit bold, but have you ever experienced any difficulties of such? I would say yes. Yeah, I would say yes, definitely. I, I think now what it is, is as, as he said, the, what we're experiencing now is that religion is under a, a scrutiny that it was never under for the previous generations. The way that we, the way that religion is viewed in our society, in the society that we live in, mm. is different to the way that the, the previous generations would have experienced it. So the same way that you said before, they were just blindly following. Mm. We don't have that sort of, we don't have that benefit. We have to sort of, we, our religion is constantly scrutinized in society when we're with our colleagues, wherever we are. They're constantly questioning. So why is it that you believe this? Why do you do this? And so for us, it's, I think the challenge really that we face is more about how do we hold on to our faith when there is this constant scrutiny around us, when society, education as a whole, is constantly promoting atheism there's no doubt about it. in my opinion that is I, I think that education as a whole the way that our system is it's promoting atheism it's not promoting any religion or, or christianity even mm. anything 
at all. So it's 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 definitely difficult to to hold on to our our identity as Muslims. Um, Do, does that also cause you to have a lack of confidence in practicing your faith and even in in in, in the belief system as a whole? Because when you're constantly being bombarded with this, like you said, atheist yeah. approach to education. Yeah, I would say definitely yes, it, it does. It creates a, a challenge um, for, and I see it all the time like in my peers as well. I know so many people who have, as you've said, the traditional Muslims have been brought up in Muslim families, but okay. they're not practicing in the way that I know that other people are, the way that I am. And it's because, it's just because of the, they're, they're a product of the society that they have grown up in. Um, and it, I think it really just does depend on the locality that you're in as well. If you've got a good mosque, uh, like yeah. Alhamdulillah, our mosque is quite helpful in the way that it reaches out to young people, then you're more likely to, to follow a, a better path. Whereas if you're in somewhere like Manchester's lucky like that, I, have, I know people who go to places like Bristol mm. and the community that they're in there, it's not, they've, they've turned very different to the way that I am here in Manchester, okay. so I think it just really depends on where you are really in the country. I'd like to obviously kind of backtracking yeah. when you said, um, now for example, I went to a very non-Muslim high school, right? I've, I've grown up in very non-Muslim areas, um, no locality to mosques, um, not surrounded by Muslims. <clears throat> and one thing, as we established earlier, um, our parents blindly follow, not necessarily blindly, but they follow what their tradition is mm. and they expected me Both as the as the son yeah. to do the same but then when i'm going to school and people are asking me well i'm i'm saying i'm muslim by name mm. do i know why i'm doing certain things mm. and my parents they never gave me the knowledge to be able to counteract the argument okay it's always oh i'm muslim because oh i don't know i pray because i don't know and my parents tell me to do but then when i'm hearing these arguments from other kids mm -hmm. and they're saying well it's a bit silly or it's a bit blah blah you know you know how kids are I used to then have those doubts in my mind and as you form these doubts in your mind again and again and again I think that really affected sort of me growing up and obviously Ahmed, he's, subhanAllah, he's been able to grow up in a Muslim community whereas I've been the complete opposite, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so, so would you reckon per generation that challenge is, 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 is actually building? It's going to be yeah. stronger and stronger and stronger? 100% I would say no, I would say oh. no, I'd say the opposite really, I think that Per generation, our generation is in a better position than the like the first generation of Pakistanis that came over here okay. in the beginning. I think that they were in a worse position. I know that when I've spoken to my elders, mm. they tell me that when they came from Pakistan in the beginning, half of these people who, mashallah, they're in the mosque now, when they first came, they were very much um, having facing the challenges of the society that we're in and sort of went off the off the rails, really. Whereas now, by the grace of Allah, our community is so big that if you if you stick around the the right people, you mm, don't you mm, won't mm. you won't face that anymore because our society, our young people, there is a thing that is the young Muslim British person. We exist now. Whereas when they came to this country, that that, was that wasn't a thing. Yeah. Mm. So I think really now, um, it's changed. And and even and even saying that, like I didn't grow up in a, um, like a, it wasn't. A, I'm from Stoke on Trent. There is a, there's a Muslim community there, but. When I went to, to school, my school was full of white people and well, not just what obviously non-Muslim people. Mm. That's what my, my sort of um, the area that I was in was full of. But we because you stick to I think it's just about sticking to your own community that causes us to, right. to hold on to our faith. Right. Really, that's what it is, really. I mean, that's, 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 yeah. that's quite uh, beautiful. What you mentioned sticking to that community. It's like the hadith of the Prophet that after your khair lies, if you stay with, with the flock, hmm. like, you know, that, that sheep that wanders off, there are more chances of it being taken by the wolf if it was to mm. wander away. Yeah. Stick to the community and that's where your lies. Okay, uh, Rabbi, coming back yeah. to you, I mean, you, you mentioned a few interesting points. You said you, your beginning was in a good environment, but you've had those challenges. What advice would you give to youngsters that are watching this podcast right now in terms of holding on to that Muslim identity? Because you look, you're going through that transition. Hmm. That's what I'm trying to highlight. What advice would you give? What do you see? From from what I saw, I can only obviously speak from personal yeah, experience. Yeah, I'll kind of walk you through my experience of it, I guess, in a way, and use that to relate it. From what I saw, I've always been one someone who's really wanted the success in this life, right? You want the flashy car, the money. That's what I grew up idolizing. And and that's why you 
It's out of this, uh, what was it? This, uh, the Entrepreneur Society, exactly, that, yeah. That society that's, that's, that was based on materialistic success. Exactly, isn't exactly, it? isn't it? Um, but when, as I was sort of growing up and I was seeing, and I, was, and I came to uni, I was seeing more Muslim um, brothers, <clears throat> I noticed that many of them, the more edu- knowledgeable they were in Islam, the more successful they were in whatever they were doing, whether oh. it was business, whether it was at mosque, but in whatever sort of realm they were. The, the more the pe- religious they were, the more successful. Yes, yes. And I, for me, that was working backwards because growing up in high school, oh, I was taught okay. the Muslim countries are the ones that are suffering. The Muslim countries are the ones, the third world countries. Mm. But now I'm seeing this sort of contradiction where now it's only the Muslims that are thriving. Mm. And for me, that was like a wake up call. Like, look, if I want their success, I have to follow in their footsteps. And that's what kind of guided me to Islam in the first place. And I think mm. if I was to kind of give advice to young brothers and sisters, look at the good qualities in people and find, okay, where, where are they coming from? Kind of find a root source. Mm. And I mean, a uh, majority of these sources are from religion. Would you not agree? Mm. I guess um, Christianity, they were uh, many of these sort of morals that are based uh, in, in the UK. Mm. They're from Christianity, and then when I used to look at it, okay, now Islam has the same morals and principles. Yeah. This is what I need to start of learn about. We also have in the background the chaplain. He refused to come on screen, even though he should have been here. But I want to request chaplain. Um, uh, Imam has got a few burning questions. Okay. I can see him burning on that seat there. Go on. And well today, Imam, to forgive me. <coughs> when it comes to identity, especially, I've got a question for you, Imam Saab. Go on. Muslim identity, yeah. So. <laughs> What is a Mus- what should a Muslim identity be? I want you to explain from an Imam's from the Islamic perspective. What should a Muslim identity identify with? What is the identity of a Muslim? What does it mean to be a Muslim? Oh, yeah, yeah. Tough question, man. Because there's so many aspects to this discussion. See, uh, you know, like 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 this, the companions when they would converse amongst themselves. A term you will find in hadith is Hum ahlu la ilaha illallah. They are the people of la ilaha illallah. Or the hadith will mention that they are the people and we are we are the nation that faces the same qibla. So the one point agenda which would unite the companions or they would unite with other companions is we are all ahlu la ilaha illallah. We are all facing the same qibla. Then there's maghfira for you. That's what makes, made them Muslim at that time. That's what their Muslim identity was. Over the generations, 1400 years have passed. And of course, like the, the brother mentioned, we're now coming to this country. The challenges are there now. Now we have to identify ourselves from the non-Muslim. So how do you do that? Now with the, the current challenges we have, for example, your Islamic attire. Some people will limit your, you know, the, the Muslim identity to just the way you look. The fact that you have a beard. Now, you will call me from, but as an imam, okay, this is the attire I, I get around with. But for, 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 for the general Muslim out there who's not in any position or when he's serving the community uh, as an imam or such, the them identity would be, well, for a sister, for example, that she's covering herself, for a brother to have a cap on his head, or for a sister to be wearing an abaya, a brother to be wearing a jubba. That's what people would identify as a Muslim identity on the outward. Then you have those people that are facing such challenges where at work, uh, at, at, in education or such, they've not built the confidence to come out with the Islamic attire yet. But they hold Islam deep in their hearts. And something as, as from as young as, you know, three, four year olds. I remember, you know, when we used to go to high school. I'm sure you guys can relate to it. And you would have uh, the Eid party or Christmas party at school. Mm. The first thing we used to ask is, is it halal? <laughs> yeah. So the sweets have been put on the table and everybody's supposed to bring their food from home, isn't it? You bring your sweets, your Harry balls or whatever. So when they put it there, the first thing we used to ask as, as a group of boys was, is it halal or not? Yeah. For us, at that tender age, our identity was halal. Is it halal or not? You know when you would go to the dinners, the dinner lady, and the first thing when you're like, you're asking the dinner lady, is this halal or not? And she would have a laugh like, yeah, fine, you're a five-year-old, what on earth are you asking, man? Just have it. Mm. But that, for me, was my Muslim identity. Yeah. Because it was instilled to me from a young age, wasn't it? 
Have you have any, any examples from young age? Not me personally. Yeah, I'm not a I'd, I'd, yeah, I would say really the same, really the the <coughs> label. I remember um, when I was in, I think, reception or very young age, that it was always, as you said, the same thing, like asking the dinner lady, is this halal? And the dinner lady, because we were in such a white area, they didn't even know like what what are they talking about? You know what is this? What is this? I don't, I don't know. What is this? This child talking about? And it's just that was un- until obviously you get old and you realize what your faith is. Mm. That was the main aspect that we don't eat pig, we don't eat haram things, we don't drink alcohol. Those were the say, like the the rules were really what our religion was until you get a little bit older and you realize like the spirituality of the religion as well. So I think even still, the, the, I'm sure there's a few generations between us, but even still, I think the challenges that we have. Or, but not the challenges. This we, the identity for for children at least is still the same. It's still the rules that the very basics. You, yeah. The very basics. Yeah. yeah, I know this. I, I, yeah. I mentioned the Islamic attire. Now you guys are wearing the soap. Yeah. When did you start, guys? Start wearing this, and is this something you do on a daily basis, or is it? How I mean, how, I'll be how, honest. I've, we've just come from Tarawi, so that is, that's 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 why <laughs> that's that's why I'm wearing the jubah today. <laughs> uh, just come from the, the masjid. Um, but I think really I try to wear the the so you, as much as I do. Yeah, I t- do. You wear to university sometimes, and recently in the last I would say couple of months, I've tried to wear it a lot more. Like I wear it to work as well. I, I work as well, so I wear it to the office when I go to work. Um, are they are they accepting? Are yeah, they... yeah, they've not sent out any. Um, emails as of yet to say <laughs> you can't wear it no but I, I've seen a few people wearing it and it, it's nice to see especially in Ramadan as well to see okay. that you know we're in we're working and we're also practicing our religion because sometimes you most of the time you can tell by someone's lips if they're fasting or not but sometimes you it's nice to see that that symbol that somebody's also observing the month of Ramadan it's right. nice at work that right. you know we're here nine to five as well but mm. so is this other person who's also um, observing the month, it's uh, it's nice to see that. But I do, I don't I've I've tried to, but I don't always wear the, the, the any Islamic. Oh, right. really. um, Your experiences. Are you doing my experience, obviously, it became normalized at university, mingling with the Isaac brothers. Um, but the, the bigger reason for me personally was okay. So I have an older sister and I have a younger sister. Okay. Um, now my older sister, she's only recently started wearing a hijab, and I'm encouraging my little sister to wear the hijab. And one sort of common theme I used to notice was they're scared to wear it. Now, why? Okay. You hear about Islamophobia, you hear about all these sort of incidents where maybe people are ripping off the hijab from uh, sisters, right? Mm-hmm. And I used to think to myself, well, me as the man, if I'm not setting an example for my sisters, how can I expect them to do the same? If I'm not comfortable wearing Islamic attire mm-hmm. that people are going to see as different, mm-hmm. When I'm out there, how can I expect my younger sister to do the same? Okay. So for me, it was like setting That's an example and mm-hmm. knowing that, look, I need to lead by example. And that way, in a way, I'm doing my small part and normalizing it. Okay, okay. If that makes sense. I, mean, yeah, uh, I, I see where you're coming from. I mean, you, you're setting the standard, isn't it? Yeah. So there should standard. be double standard. So we, our expectation of sisters to wear exactly. the full attire. Exactly, 100%. But for yeah, the exactly. brothers, never to have anything on. Yeah, 100%. Exactly. 100%. Okay, okay. Interesting, interesting. Okay, do, okay. This this attire, and we, we mentioned that the, the brothers wearing the Islamic Tata attire and, and sisters. Do you see the challenges are more for the sisters than the brothers? It's more challenging for the sisters. Yeah, yeah, of course. Depending on where they are, really, yes. I mean, again, what? and the reason I say that is Manchester, we're very lucky here that mm. there's a big Muslim community and there's always there's always hijabis, there's always Muslim. You can see visibly Muslim people wherever you go in this city. I believe there's hardly any areas where you wouldn't see a Muslim person mm. and well, maybe a couple of years, 10, 15 years back it was probably a, a bit different but now I think the way that it is is that Muslim people are very visible within society but again the challenge that's faced by Muslims across the, the country varies because in areas like here where there's big Muslim community there are visibly Muslim people so it's, it's it, to wear the hijab they'll fit in straight away Whereas if it's some you know very quiet village in the north somewhere it's it's not it's not the same is it it's uh, mm-hmm. it's difficult so it will vary from like uh, area to area. Definitely. Well, Manchester, yeah. Manchester, 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 we have yeah. uh, Imams, I think you could uh, fill us in. Uh, the last statistics I remember there are eighty thousand students in Manchester and this much more much more now yeah much more so there's over in just Oxford Road on Oxford Road alone yeah so there's over eighty thousand on Oxford Road so they call it Manchester Manchester University mm. and then if you cruise Salford. Yeah. University, 
um, obviously different cities were still on our patch, and then you got Bolton, and then you got Buchan. Yeah. There's well over a hundred or thousand students. Wow. In our with the question of three or four miles, put it that way. Wow. Man. When the students are here, you can feel it in the city. And and, and it's so diverse as well. And I'm, it's good. It works on their end as well, doesn't it? It brushes off on them. Hmm. Yeah. Is they having that exposure as well? Let's not yeah. just always look at our. our <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. It brushes it off on them when they see you guys dressed this way. Have you ever been questioned about it, brother? Like, yeah. bro, why are you wearing this? Yeah. By a, a, a non-Muslim colleague, and how you how's that conversation gone 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 on? It was literally just a matter of telling them, okay, what explaining to them what modesty is and what just kind of giving them knowledge. Okay, this is the aura, um, this is how we should dress. This is similar to what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would wear, and that's why I'm wearing it. And for them, that just sufficed it enough. Um, so they wouldn't go pee on that and ask like, "Are you guys going mad? <laughs> <laughs> what are you guys wearing? Wearing a dress? And, uh, <laughs> yeah, you can't even wear one man. You can't run for your life in this Dubai." Uh, I think I've not faced any sort of challenges like okay. that. Recently. I mean, the most that somebody's ever commented is it looks good, like complimented. Nobody's ever gone out of their way to say anything um, negative. But mm. that's the thing. I know. I know a lot of sisters who have faced, like the mm -hmm. sort of like I know my my own sisters when they sort of um, work at work. My sister wearing, started wearing the hijab. I know that she faced so many challenges when she started wearing it because they and you would want to share it was i mean specifically it was stuff to do with like she noticed a change in the people around her the way that they were dealing with her mm. uh, they there was i mean to the point that she stopped going into the office she asked her manager to work from home oh, wow. um she lowered her hours she's had a lot of issues with that but she, it was and it's not even far from here salford like very very close to here that she had those issues but i think it's 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 you wouldn't expect it as well because the she she works in an office a quite sort of like it's a well educated job that she's in. You wouldn't think mm -hmm. that you'd you'd have those that, those that issues there. Discrimination there. Yeah, but it's the people the way that the people switched up when she mm -hmm. started to embrace her like Islamic identity. It it was she said that she felt it herself. I said any, that, any yeah. advice on on how a sister could actually challenge the norm within a company where she, like you saw where, where your yeah. sister was working or in an educational institute where there may be a bit of backlash in uh, coming in that Islamic attire I think the main thing would be to hold firm at the end of the day these this is something that is it's a it's an obligation isn't it for, for especially for sisters of course the hijab is an obligation and in most lines of work, unless they pull out some rules about hygiene or, or something along those lines, which sometimes some companies use, like for food and things, places like that, they try to have these regulations. But there wouldn't, nobody would really, there's not a way to legally justify asking somebody not to wear the hijab in the UK. There's, it, there's, there's a lot of framework that protects it. And if it was, if, if a company was to openly discriminate, um, the the person is being discriminated against the laws mostly on their side there's not i don't think there'd be a case where the the law wouldn't be on their side sure. um, I mean, it's weird really, you actually even mentioned the aspect of law yeah. and regulation because uh for tomorrow's podcast we actually have a, a a barrister who will be coming on and discussing islamophobia as from a legal context yeah how we tackle it what laws we have that support us to what extent can we push that mm. Uh, and really giving us a framework uh, which will really, for the viewers, uh, it'll be really, really uh, interesting, inshallah. Um, uh, Abrad, maybe a comment from you. How, how could individuals co uh, and, and communities combat Islamophobia and, and promote this level of understanding? Like he, he mentioned, uh, Ahmed, that we're here now. Yeah? And we've, Alhamdulillah, we've established ourselves in every sector, hmm. in every walk of life. You'll see a Muslim somewhere, either at, at, at every grade, yeah. working and serving the community. Maybe, for example, NHS, maybe GMP. Some of the, the, the lead in GMP are all, all, all Muslims. NHS, some of the lead surgeons, consultants, they're all Muslims. If you look at the building sector, you know, the, uh, some of the biggest names out there are all Muslims. So how, how, how do you, build, how do you uh, raise awareness on that? I think the most important part as an older brother, as if someone's a parent, and I think yep. Mama and Sabi will agree, mm. just increasing just the knowledge 
knowledge of knowledge of Islam, why we do certain things, the the reason behind it, the hadith behind it, because it it increases awareness of many small little things that you may be normalizing in your day to day life mm. that you might think, oh, maybe I need to kind of check myself on this, right? Because that's certainly what the case would have happened with me. And I'll use my uh, example of my little brother. Okay. Uh, he attends the weekend classes as well, and from how he interacts at, in the same high school that I went to. Okay. To how I was, it's stark. Oh, in wow. a way, in a way, he's like he's he's like a sheikh in his little <laughs> Muslim friends community because he just he can answer questions here and there okay. that many of the Muslim students don't know. And in a way, they've managed to form a sense of community on, in that high school, which because I because of would, one person because of one person because I has an older brother. I have taken to him to his class, and now he's been able to increase in knowledge, and he's able to pass on that knowledge. Mm. And I think for me, that's such an important thing. And I'll use it as for my little sister as well. Now that I'm in, like, kind of, I'll tell her a bit here and there, okay. and now she's able to apply it in her life, tell her friends about it, and just have genuine taqwa, right? Mm. Of okay, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. All these little things. So knowledge, See, knowledge, knowledge, knowledge is power, and, and as long as it comes equipped with amal as well, isn't it? Yes, of course. And being consistent in whatever. Uh, apparent deeds, Islamic rituals that you're performing. For example, if it's Salah, hmm. you know, we, we, we see that I've had a few phone calls and, and messages, some advice from parents and people that Imam Saab, my children want to pray namaz in Ramadan, uh, in schools, hmm. any advice? And my first question is, what happened before Ramadan? Hmm. So if you're building this uh, yeah. and, 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 and you really want the school or the institution to accommodate for you in the month of Ramadan, what you really need to be doing is being consistent in that message that you're portraying yeah. to them. Exactly. Otherwise, they see like these guys annually, they'll just need a little room, they'll give you a room yeah. for a few weeks, and then after that, that room's gone. Because hmm. they know nobody's going to turn up. Yeah. yeah. I think really it's, it is, it's up to individuals to, to raise their children in that way. Because I remember when I went to, when in high school, in our, in our high school, there was, I mean, there was, in, well, in my primary school, there wasn't many Muslim people, but in high school, there was quite a few. And what the way that it was there was that they set up a, a multi faith room for us. Okay. And it was always busy. Uh, on our lunchtime, the students used to go. They used to pray Zohar, and that's the way that it was. That was consistently. Mm. There was some complaints. Some staff didn't used to like it. That why do these students have a space? Yep. Why don't other faiths have a space? Even though it was a multi faith room, but they mm. felt that the Muslims were taken over. Eventually, the Muslims were given a whole separate space. To the other faiths just so that we could because we were using it the most and, yeah. and so that there was that equality um and as you said not just in ramadan outside of ramadan as well and even and, and that when you're in those ages it's because parents have encouraged it's mm. not i don't think that kids in year seven year eight year nine when they're in high school are going to randomly start praying it's it's their parents that will have told them to pray and yeah. given and told them about the importance of praying um, so yeah, I think more is definitely down to upbringing. Yeah, I've, I, I can relate yeah. to it as well because my, my nephew last year, he was sat here in this position and he was answering a similar question and he, was, he, and he described that he got the school to give them a room because he got a petition signed, mm. dropped yeah. a little document, yeah. got a petition signed by wow. everybody, submitted it to the head of year and then they were granted a room for them to pray their salah wow. because all it took was a few brothers that we're going to pray on a daily basis. Yeah. yeah. They know if it's just a weekly or an annual occurrence, yeah. they're not going to give you any significance, are they? Exactly. So that part becomes part of your Muslim identity. Yeah. So now our workplaces or in, in universities, schools, they identify you by the salah that you perform. Mm. They identify you when, for example, you're making this demand for halal lunch yeah. or for a break for salah. That then becomes your identity toward, for, for them, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. every time they see you, okay, and, and subhanAllah, you, you'll notice that they'll actually accommodate. Yeah. Hmm. Many times, it's us who are the problem. Yeah. We've not got the uh, confidence to bring up yeah. these subjects and, yeah. and approach a manager and say, look, yeah. manager sahab, I need a break. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think it's about engagement. Muslims need to engage yeah, that's with the people use, that yeah. they're yeah. Em employed by or whether it's the universities or whether whatever it is, we have to engage. Like recently, an example I can think of is uh, at work, there's a growing number of Muslims. We, there wasn't many when I first started there, but now there's quite a few Muslims. Okay. Um, and the food was never halal. The, the, the management of the, the food, they sent out a, an email to all the staff to fill in this form on what sort of dietary requirements we have. Okay. And based on that, they'd change it. The Muslim 
employees they didn't fill out the form they didn't fill oh, it out it closed okay. nobody nothing was changed because not enough muslims filled it out the next time they did that we us, us brothers at the at the at the workplace we set up a group chat um to discuss other things mostly to juma timings and stuff like that because they used to do juma um there and when when that form was sent out we sent that in the group chat straight away within i think we had like 60 responses straight away on there across the the company okay. and within a few weeks they sent out an email saying from now on all the food served upstairs will be um halal while the chicken and the meat will be halal will be serving and wow. that's all it took it was just that engagement if we if we hadn't have engaged that wouldn't have happened but it's small things like that like it's not a big deal to have like halal food available but it is really it makes a difference isn't it and it's from engagement really if we if we don't engage it's, it's, it's like that these says isn't it where yeah. there's a well, well we use it in english where there's yeah. a will there's a way yeah mm-hmm. yeah so you've got to make that effort and the hadith yeah. describes the hadith could see that if you come a hand span a hand length towards me then my rahma comes an arm length towards you subhanallah if you come walking towards me i make an effort a walking mm-hmm. refers to physically walking or even yeah. you know like they say take the baby steps yeah, yeah. at least make an effort towards allah yeah and then the hadith described that his mercy comes running towards you you will see the doors open and like you mentioned the word engagement engage with them from from a, from an early stage and then be persistent and consistent in that message that you relate to them because once the, that consistency is not there they'll know he's probably just had a phase yeah Yeah, he's at a high, <laughs> and now he's having a low. You know, and yeah. they're not going to cater for that. These mm. people want, you know, longevity yeah. in whatever consistency. demand. Consistency. Yeah. yeah, consistency. Yeah. No. Okay, part of our identity, let's get a bit more nitty-gritty then. Part of identity is within the... Okay, this was like Muslim to non-Muslim identity we've discussed yeah. so far. Within the Muslim, yeah, we have identity crisis, don't we? <laughs> yeah, now, definitely. You guys are from universities. That's a lot of time this is where the crisis boom takes place within mm, yeah. the Muslim community. Yeah. Cuz put it this way you always gone to your local masjid. Yeah. Local masjid Imam Sahib is a Hanafi Sunni yeah just doing the standard box standard as you would say. And then now suddenly you you walk into an ice hockey. Bro. Everyone's doing that. All the they all look different. They all wear different. Nobody's yeah. praying the way that you think that, they should be that you've always yeah. seen. Yeah. What's your experiences of that? Much more. Yeah. So, so I mean, there's a lot of. I mean, being involved in ISOC, there's a lot of differences that I come across. Okay. And a lot of vocal differences that I come yeah. across as well. There's a lot of people who, <laughs> um, who are. V- who are obviously we're all muslims but because of the differences between us there are certain groups that will s- project their views as being superior to yours that's okay. the way that I'd, I'd word it really the, and it's it becomes a part of their whole identity as a muslim is that they follow that path and you don't follow that path okay. so therefore they are on the right path and you are misguided you know And it's 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 true. I mean, the, if does I told it, you at, at any point yeah. become become kufr and Islam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does uh, very very much because it's, uh, a lot of times you know the I'm I've been accused. I won't say what I've been accused of, but a lot of people have have come out with statements that okay. you know you are worse than this type of person because oh, you you oh, do that. Oh. I, I, it's shocking, really, and I think it definitely. Yeah, all of you that under one roof. Yeah, and yeah. and the thing is, I w- you I wouldn't expect anybody who's not. in that sort of age range a university student i wouldn't expect anyone who's in their 30s to make a comment like that you'd only expect it from somebody who's a little bit maybe immature if that's the word or okay. people who are not sort of looking at things from the right perspective okay yeah hello oh, okay so have you been called thing things <laughs> i have just not been as uh, open about yeah. things I oh. think, especially considering he, um, he hides uh, recently... his, his affiliation okay. <laughs> okay. to the he does especially yeah. recently because I've been learning about these topics I can voice my opinions on these okay. topics okay. Um, okay. but in terms of no, I think uh, your teachers do do quite a bit in equipping you with the tools yes mashallah but I have very good teachers um, <laughs> <laughs> um but i think i think it's it's more to do with I, okay. how i see it is they just want good for you as same same as i if i if i meet a brother and i genuinely like him mm. 
I want him to be on the same path of you path as me right yeah. I if I if I feel like that's wrong I'm gonna call it out and vice versa goes well, away if they think if they think I'm doing something wrong or they think I'm not doing something the hundred percent correct way mm. they advise me on it and I think it's just us as it's we're at that age where we're just sort of clashing, clashing heads yeah, all the time. and I think yeah. you're gonna get that at university you know what I mean uh, testosterone levels are high everyone just wants to sort of argue so and debate passionate, isn't exactly it? exactly You're passionate about, about yeah. religion especially yeah. university is it though this is what i think is it really passionate about religion that derives these then? arguments it's it just then? people as he said just people trying to show that they yeah. are no not banter really just people trying to win arguments to be to prove that they're right that they're in the right and whether that's to do with the topic of religion mm. or whether that's something else in their life they just want to prove that they are is it in really the right is it really I, I, some of the conversations that i have they are very bad, I would say, definitely. Are, are, it's are pe- they public ones or are they, are they like the, the private ones where it's just you... The, 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 public, the I would say definitely public, yeah. When there's like a group, a large group of people and, you know, you're being called out for being on the wrong path, I think it's always better to stay silent, right? In issues okay. of like differences of opinions, because there's so many differences of opinions, yeah. it's better to just stay silent because we know and we know that within the Ummah there is so much difference and... A lot of scholars say that difference is permissible. You're, there's allowed to be different routes yeah. of doing things, yeah. Yeah. and I I think really personally, it's about not en- again engagement. It's about not engaging with those conversations right. and trying to sort of so be above that. I try, I try to diffuse, like, no, but no, no, no. I still end up in all the situations because just due to my affiliation, really I, to I think, I think to the really, masjid, really that's what okay. it is. Yeah. Okay. Like, <laughs> from how I see it, it's obviously yeah. I mean, you can relate. There's just a lot of miss. Conceptions. Conceptions. Yeah. And we try and iron them out, and okay. usually, usually it doesn't go our way, right? They'll, like for example, I'm, I'm not gonna name anything. No, there's no names. No, 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 no names. Mm. As in, okay, let's say for example, there's this certain topic, and what? this is people's ideas of it, but we're telling well, them no. Throw it, throw it in. Let's what see. topic is it? Sufism, oh, for example. Yeah. Right, go. Right. Go people go think obviously that, when that is a big. It is. It is. It is. Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll. <laughs> so I'll go good. Like, internationally, mm. you know, you're. Even if you travel abroad, I don't know how well, I mean, how many times you guys travel. I travel quite, quite a lot. Yeah. Um, till now, uh, only one situation where I was called out and asked, like, Muslim, yeah, Muslim. Like, what type of Muslim? Yeah. And my safety net was Sufi Muslim. Hmm. Nice and easy. No yeah. issues. Carry going. Hmm. Now, had I identified in a different way that I'm not a Sufi Muslim, it could have gone horribly wrong. Mm, yeah. Because Sufi Muslim identity is considered to be like the safe, cool guys. Mm. They're going to do no uh, horrific things. Yeah. Yeah. As in, they're not from, they're not extremist in that yeah. sense. Yeah. To, to the world view. Yeah. 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 Whereas Sufi Islam within the Muslim denomination to the other end of the spectrum yeah. Yeah. is considered the extremist. Yeah. yeah. So go on. Well, what challenges have you had there? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just a matter of misinformation, right? They're misinformed. They think what so Sufism is more about your nafs and purifying your nafs. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. Yeah. They think, okay, that for them that they don't even know that's a part of Sufism. They just see the videos of the sort of zikr and the, uh, maybe maybe sort of the extreme side of Sufism and they label that as deviation, what, deviation oh, and they okay. say yeah. that is the entire of Sufism. Mm-hmm. Now, if, now just because a minority does it, now they're associating everyone who may identify the Sufi as being that, right? Yeah. But I think that happens in every sort of um, mm. realm, no? Yeah, but, yeah. but you could turn the table on them as well, isn't it? How Show so? them an extreme view of them mm. and say, look, is that all of you then? Yeah, true, true. Fair, yeah. Yeah, okay. How much success are you having in these, these discussions? I'm interested, man. Um, I mean... <laughs> because in my, in, my, in my uni days, I actually... Yeah. actually in my uni days, I used to be the uh, keyboard warrior. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, back I wish then, I was Facebook keyboard. Was, 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 was quite big. Yeah, yeah. So, some of people speak shit. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> you know, you have these, these guys called the shit computer boosters. Computer yeah. boosters, yeah. I, I, I got blocked. <laughs> from their Facebook, I got blocked from their YouTube channels as well. Cause look, I used to go in heavy, like a child, yeah. TK. Come on, then let's let's have that discussion. Then they mm. came point where you know, therefore you know, this guy knows a bit too much. Yeah, mm. you gotta block him now. Mm. So after I got blocked, then I that the hype was gone. Mm. Cause you realize 
It's not worth it, really. Yeah. It's not worth it, and neither are they really listening. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. I think that's the thing. At the end of the day, after a certain point, people stop listening. Okay. You can't. You can't. People who are set in their ways, you can't change them. You can obviously do du'a for them that they go to the right path, but mm. realistically, we're very limited in the way that we can change people, especially if their parents are on a different path. Mm. We, as students, us having these conversations, it's not going to make a difference. It's to pointless. Anything, really. It's pointless. I mean, it's, it increases understanding. I'd say it increases mm. understanding. I think it's good, beneficial that we have these discussions where we can give them the the, the points of views that we have as well. But I don't think anyone's going to be changing their minds as a result of our little uh, debate. That's what I yeah, think. Yeah, true. That's very yeah. true. Very true. Yeah. I mean, did you ever face these challenges before uni? Or is it something specific to universities? I mean... I mean did, did this uh, inter-Muslim crisis, identity crisis, is that something that's in universities? A lot more, definitely. A lot more? more. Yes, I never... I mean, before I came to university, I never called myself a Sufi. I never really... Um, you just Muslim. Just Muslim, yeah, Muslim. Ahlus Sunnah wal Jamaat. That was what oh, yeah. we were. Ahlus Sunnah. <laughs> this is what we were. We weren't. Uh, yeah, we didn't uh, sort of ascribe to Sufism. Well, I mean, we did engage in practices that were Sufism, but we didn't label ourselves as specifically a Sufi Muslim. Okay. I still wouldn't go out of my way to to say that I'm a Sufi Muslim. Mm-hmm. I just it's just not what I just because of the perceptions that people have of it. Okay. I wouldn't go out of my way to call myself a Sufi Muslim. But just Sunni, just Sunni, Sunni Muslim, yeah, 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 Muslim, Sunni, yeah. What mosque you go to? That mosque, and that's that they, and that's it. that they know from then, from then on. That's then it's, on, then it's known, on. yeah. But uh, I wouldn't. Before I came to university, there wasn't even a question of what sect are you and what you know. But this is you. You beautifully highlighted that yeah. it's opened the door of reading research. Yeah. To know, okay, why do we actually have these practices? Exactly. Yeah. Why am yeah. I doing this at the local masjid? Yeah. Why is the local masjid yeah. holding a molly? Yeah. Why are they doing the jaloos? Why if are they anything, doing the yeah. I've I found that I've become closer so to the masjid from these sort of debates Discussion. because after researching them, like in my own family, my cousins, a lot of my cousins, mm. they are, they don't they don't go to the same mosques as anymore. Okay. They've become on a different side. They don't they don't ascribe to the same principles as was in the way okay. that we do. But, and I went through a phase where I was closer to that as well because they were the youth and when I used to be with them, they would teach me certain things and say, you know, the things that grandma is doing is wrong, it's bidda, this is wrong, we shouldn't do this, the beer that she's going to, it's wrong, it's all incorrect. And for a while I was, you know, also into that. Like, yeah, but then I realised from, obviously it's personal opinions, but I realised from really the way that certain people were presenting themselves, the, what is the word, akhlaq, is it yeah, akhlaq, yeah? yeah? The way that they that they were in their day to day lives, that the way that my grandmother was, she was a pious woman, right? And to think that her path was the wrong path and the path of these people uh, was the right path, I don't see the the sort of I I so personally hard. that made so me closer to our masjid than I. You, yeah, I mean I'll let you finish, but kind yeah. of going back to the akhlaq point, and when you asked the question earlier about what advice I'd give to Muslims, right, mm. young Muslims. Mm. Facing these challenges, um, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was presented with the best of a clock, yeah. and that's how he was able to teach us the deen. Mm. If we look out the, for the people with the best of a clock, surely we're going to find the people who are righteous, the people who are pious, who exactly. are on the right uh, path. I think mm-hmm. that's, that's that's all I wanted to say because it kind of relates to the point of oh well, everyone's got a different tariqa, right? Everyone might be well, Sufi, well, Salafi, whoever, whoever. Just look at the people who are on have good akhlaq and good adab and just sort of yeah. see, okay, what are they doing and what am I doing wrong? I mean, you would have good akhlaq in both ends, both sides. Yeah, there's whether you're Sufi, yeah. whether you're Salafi. Yeah. So how do you know who's right, who's wrong? From personal experience, I think it it keeps you away from the really sort of extreme ends. Mm. And you can't, it's like a spectrum, I, I think, right? Okay. You, there's extreme... On both and sides, on both yeah. sides. Yeah. Yeah. it just it narrows you down so to I'm being more so sort of okay. Yeah. Now, now I've got my two three options. Now I can kind of be like, okay, what do I personally resonate so with? So I mean, this is why the, the Quran says, "Wakadalika jamilakum ummatu wasata." We've made you the uh, moderate ummah. Hmm. We have moderation in everything that we do. Exactly. And really, what we are are, are seeking here is to identify ourselves. As closest to the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam As closest to the Hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And that's where Afiyah and Al-Khayr lies 
uh, for the Ummah. I mean, that's been quite interesting in terms of, you know, the uh, okay, any of the challenges at university in terms of identity. I know you, that we've mentioned Muslim, non-Muslim, yeah. the inter-Muslim. Yeah, um, specific to university, the only other thing that I could think of really would be, I mean, I wouldn't say blatant Islamophobia. Oh, okay. But I, w- I, I had some instances with the, as, as part of the, the chaplain's shaking his head right now. Well, but as, <laughs> as <laughs> um, yeah, so as the as in my role as the within the Islamic society okay. at the university, we are the largest society at the university. We're the most active one. We have events every single day. We have something, whether that's a charity stall, whether that's a dawah stall, whether that's um, a brother's social or a sister's social. We've always got something going on. As a result of that, we're always sort of. At loggerheads with sometimes not loggerheads really, but we sometimes we find ourselves at loggerheads with the university, and it's is, is, is that them scrutinizing your policy or is it your activity? I would say really what I've noticed in the last year after the seventh well after the events of the seventh of October mm. is that there's been a change in that level of scrutiny because with the larger society we've always had scrutiny, mm. but. Since then, there were so many instances, I'm not going to go through the list of them, but things like random Muslim students being accused of not following procedures by random members of staff when Jummah is going on, even though that's nothing to do with our society, um, mm. that we've not followed the procedure, we've not, gone, we've not told which speaker is going to be coming in, even though that's nothing to do with us, but just because of the fact that we were there as Muslims, we were accused of not following Certain procedures And it is it's, I wouldn't were you say following procedure? We were following procedures Because the Jummah Wasn't something managed by us It's managed by Our, our chaplaincy really It's not something That's even anything To do with us But the fact that we Represented the Islamic society mm. This sort of assumption Was made that we Are the ones who are Who are vetting The people that are coming in For Jummah We're the ones who are, are Dealing with that When that wasn't the case And it was simply At the time It was a brother Who was just stood there He wasn't even anything To do with the Islamic society But a random member of staff coming over to him and, and saying to him, you know, you, you need to do this, you need to follow this procedure, when he's not got anything to do with any of this, he's just stood there in his jubba. Could, could it be the case that just post 7th of, of October, yeah. that we've become a bit, a bit, bit, bit sensibly? Or, you know, you know what I mean? I, you could so say anybody that. Anybody that says yeah. anything is like, oh, we're going to flare up straight away and we're going to relate, I mean. Know, yeah, you you could you could. I mean, that's one way to to think about it. But is that true looking, to some extent? I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say because we've noticed, as obviously, the Islamic society at university. We've been at the university for many many years, right? So right. it's been I think twenty twenty ten or even before that. I think okay. it was it was started. There's, it's been a very long time that it's been at the university, and just comparing the way that the university has dealt with us this year. As compared to the way that it dealt with us last year, things like fundraising, we used to mm. fundraise for Palestine in in our busiest building. We're not allowed to do that anymore. We've been relegated to this to a building that nobody even goes to anymore. Whereas before, we used to openly um, raise funds for our causes. And whereas a week after the seventh of October, there was a, a sudden change in policy, um, where you know there was rules were changed, and those rules disproportionately affect our society because we're the only one. Well. With the, we're always winning the award for the most fundraising um, And it, it was stuff like that And it's not just to do with the charities It's other things like the the way that the policies are sort of used against us When we're planning an event, midway through our event They'll say, sorry, but you've, you've not been following this procedure We need to change things, mm-hmm. something different So, so you mean, um, well, go on, uh, in, no, in I, I, also, go on I would say where um, Islamophobia really affects our young people is in the next phase in the job market. Yeah. So anyone who's visibly Muslim going to interviews have experienced a lot of discrimination. Some of our students go on placement, they've experienced discrimination, Islamophobia when they go on placement. Being asked odd questions about their practices. I think within the university sometimes there's no doubt that there are instances where students have a right to say, well, we feel this is Islamophobia yeah. and we take it very seriously. Mm. And especially when it's brought to my attention but I feel for young people, especially, the, the, the part where it affects them the most is where they need to get into yeah. the real world. I think mm-hmm. that's why there's the distinction between the university being blatantly Islamophobic 
and it not being because I don't think the university is Islamophobic in any way. I just think that certain factors within the university there are certain mm. aspects of the way that the university deals with its largest society that could be viewed as having islamophobic components right yeah. i wouldn't say i wouldn't say that the, i don't think i don't think really in a university that has such a huge number of muslim students can afford to be islamophobic so i don't yeah. think that they are islamophobic in any way it doesn't they're not this is to say they're islamophobic is silly they're not islamophobic mm. it's just there are there have been instances that I don't think the university has dealt with properly, that were could be seen as Islamophobic, and if they if they're not if that's not what they are, then mm. they should have been dealt with differently. And of course, the, these are things that I'm sure are happening to students up and down the country, and it is well documented. There are so many students associations, Muslim students associations, up and down the country that are saying that their universities cracked down on them post after the seventh of Oct- October. There's been so many differences in the way that they're treating them and I think that's also reflected in the way that our university is dealing with us so if, as if well. you guys have flagged it up yeah have you seen any response any change any and uh, it, it cooling down or I the, mean or the measures that they've put in that they've been eased in any way have, have you been listened to basically I think and if anything we're more proactive in making sure that we're following all the procedures so that nobody mm. has an ah, issue okay. but what we found nice. is that even when we follow the procedures okay there can still be instances where they, they'll, they'll pull something out of nowhere in the same way that was never done before. Because at the end of the day, students' associations, these unions, they are meant to be for the students, right? Mm. As the largest society, we'd expect that they want to work with us because yeah, we're the ones yeah. that are most active. But instead, we've always found that instead of them being cooperative with us, they, they don't want to cooperate. And it's always at the back of our minds that is this because... We're, is it because we're, we're Muslims and we're, we're studying here in our thobes and mm. going around collecting donations for Palestine? Is that is that what it is? Is that I mean, I, I wouldn't say yes, it is. I would say it's probably a factor within a factor, that. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. We also come to the end, end of the hour. I remind everyone again for tomorrow's podcast with the with the barrister and president of uh, MCM. I think we're gonna tackle this head on with him in terms of Islamophobia and how it's been seen uh, in workplaces like Imam Sam mentioned, getting jobs uh, in different sectors. Uh, we'll, we'll delve into that in more detail. And Imam Sam, I want you to come to uh, Gade as well. I'm going to have you on tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, get ready. And then we want to really uh, have, have a, a good hot discussion tomorrow, inshallah. But JazakAllah, Brother Ahmed and Abrar, for being here. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, you know, I wish I could go back to uni. <laughs> and uh, bust a bit more <laughs> now I actually have a bit more knowledge yeah, that yeah. I can probably give a grounding those debates yeah, yeah, but, uh, yeah as, as long as the discussions are healthy and they're not discriminative in any way uh, see the messenger Islam described ikhtilaf ummati rahma that even the the dispute within my ummah has a rahma with it yeah. which is that it opens doors of research yeah. if somebody's not praying the way I'm praying yeah. And they quiz you on it, the brother. You're doing wrong. Then at least look like like you guys have you mentioned yourself. You've gone back and you've read. If anything, it's helped you connect to your religion and your identity much better, hasn't it? Mm-hmm, so inshallah, that is the, the, the message. Uh, but if you do want further details, then inshallah, uh, come to MCM. Inshallah, we will uh, <laughs> we will, we, we will yeah. ground you in your faith <laughs> and your faith. Yes, so you inshallah. Can go back as a yes. warrior. Yes. <laughs> okay, salamu alaikum. Sorry,